beauty, described as a combination of qualities, such as shape, color, or form, that pleases the aesthetic senses. The aesthetic senses differ for particular individuals and for groups. These differences create separation of ideas, causing some people groups to feel superior and other groups to feel inferior, as in reference to skin color, which leads to what is currently known as colorism. Hi, I'm Chris Zander. When we think of the term racism and self-hate, we often equate it to the dysfunction between white culture and black and brown culture. While this form of racism continues to be an issue, we barely scratch the surface of various forms of racism, such as colorism. The term colorism is defined as prejudice or discrimination against individuals with dark skin tones, typically amongst people of the same ethnic or racial group. Now one might ask, is this truly an issue amongst people of color? And if so, what is the origin of this? While yes, this is an issue, the main origin of colorism reverts back to fragmentation within slavery. A prime example of this is the Willie Lynch letter, which was intentionally designed to build generational division amongst African Americans and to further create a culture of oppression against both white and black individuals, and most importantly, to pit black individuals against other blacks. I sat down with two professors from Austin Peay State University to discuss why colorism continues to be an issue. And here's what they shared. So right now, I'm gonna start off with Dr. Monique Freeman. How are you today? Good, how are you? Good, and I have Dr. Eva Gibson. How are you today? Doing well. Good. So Dr. Monique, colorism is truly an issue and it's been an issue for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it's still an issue here in the 21st century? I would say three tiers to that, but ultimately the first is fear. And it's not fear of dealing with, because if you think about it, colorism is an unfortunate byproduct of whiteness, white culture, and white supremacy. And this fear that, especially within the black community we experience, is not the fear of white people, but the fear of being marginalized, the fear of being minoritized. And eventually that leads to dealing with racial trauma and those effects. So the reason why colorism, I think, is prominent in the black community in the 21st century is because we're trying to avoid that fear, avoid that experience. So how has fear and this particular experience caused people of color to self-deprecate and sabotage one another based on traumas that stem back from slavery? Is it intentional that people of color further damage one another? Or is this taught and learned behavior something we have become unconsciously accustomed to? One might ask, what are the ranging experiences of colorism? The first introduced experience is from the dark skin perspective. Darker complected individuals are often the most underrepresented, undervalued, and oftentimes illustrated as the joke of ranging complexions by both white and black individuals. Our society is taught by the old children's rhyme. If you're black, stay back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're white, you're all right. While this further illustrates the brown paper bag analogy, if you're lighter than a brown paper bag, the more accepted you are or the more you pass for white. This insane behavior in form of oppression illustrates just how far we as a nation have to go for improvement. If being white means we are right, then both black and white people need to take a deeper look within ourselves because in God's eyes, we are all right. I grew up in River Rouge, Michigan. I was, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. And colorism, it affected my childhood because obviously I am a dark complected woman. So there were some challenges and things that I faced as a young person. I'm uh, from Los Angeles, California. Colorism is, is um, actually played a huge role in my childhood. Uh, my older brother, he was the one that was at home the most, um, other than my father, because um, my father was always out working. And so that's who I had to kind of look up to. And my brother is very light-skinned. And so um, seeing 
how many folks said that we looked alike, um, but I did not see that for myself because I noticed my complexion and I noticed his. Um, and my older sister is uh, almost right in the middle of both of us. So she's a, a fairly brown, caramel complected, um, and he's very light skinned and I was very dark skinned. And so um, it was refreshing to at least be the same complexion as my father, um, but it was definitely interesting being out and about uh, with my older brother and older sister and um, them not necessarily seeing um, that we looked alike. Um, so that was always interesting. I would say during that time, it did not seem like it was acceptable uh, to have dark skin. I was teased. I was called names like with your black self, things like that. And so it made me not love the skin that I was in. And I questioned like, why? Why do I have this dark skin? I thought being a lighter complected as a girl, I felt like they received more love. The boys, they liked the girls that had the light complected skin. And I didn't have a boyfriend in elementary school or middle school and even going into high school. And my grandmother would always say to me, you know, why don't you have a boyfriend? And I always thought maybe if I was lighter and even because of my height, but I thought that maybe if my skin tone, if I was a lighter complected uh, young woman, that would make a difference. I grew up as a kid in the 90s, and during the 90s was, was not the time for, for dark men. There were very few dark male celebrities that were getting praised. And so um, that was the time for light skin for sure. I think that that, that maybe took a, um, it took a little bit of a time for me to truly and fully find myself attractive because one, I'm under my brother who I see, who has eight years on me, so I'm seeing him go through his dating years um, while I'm still fairly young, and I just seen him, you know, dating so many different girls, and I just didn't know for sure if I would be able to have that same life because I was dark skinned. I felt like I was overlooked. Um, I was disrespected because of the color of my skin, so I would have to say yes. I don't know about the most because I can speak for myself, but. There were times where I was disrespected. People, you know, they'll look at your skin color and they compare and they'll say, well, I'm darker than you. It's like, it's almost offensive. Like, oh my gosh, you're darker. It's, it's okay. Like, it's okay to love the skin that you're in. So disrespect, yes, I felt that, felt a lot of it. And then my dad, when he and my mom, they had, they had a lot going on. But when they would argue, he would always like, say mean things about her skin tone, her color being dark because he's light skinned man. And so I always felt like, you know, that's why I didn't like being dark skinned because my dad, he would say something and my mom would get so upset. Like, what you call me? You know, with your black self? And she didn't. And so it made me not like that. As far as being called out for my complexion, I think it's actually, prob in my personal experience, has been the opposite. Um, what I mean by that is, is that it was heavily said that light skin was pretty and light skin was better. And there wasn't people necessarily saying dark skin was ugly, but when you look at yourself and you notice that you aren't light skin, it was reinforcing that. Um, when it comes to my family, um, and my wife will kind of joke about this uh, a lot because I, I didn't notice how much I did it. Um, and I was in the wrong basically in my own household when I, uh, I have my daughter and she's a beautiful little brown girl, which is what I would have expected because of our two complexions. My wife is lighter skinned and I'm dark skinned. Um, and so she came out like a brown, maybe a little bit closer to my complexion. Then my son came out and he was much lighter. And so the joke was, you know, I was, I, I don't know how to raise a light skinned son. You know, I don't know how to. And so I used to kind of joke around about that, like, oh, he's, you know, he, he, he a little too light for me, or he's a this, or, you know, even joking around with her like, hey, do you need, do you need to tell me something? Because he, ain't, he don't look like me. <laughs> but he does actually look a lot like me, but he is lighter skin. And so he got that from his mom. And his mom always says like, hey, don't, I don't know if you notice, but you do it a lot more than, than you think you do. And, it, and it, it was always in a joking manner, but it was still there. Um, and so growing up, um, he, he is only two years old, so it, 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 I'm sure it hasn't stuck yet, but if I was 
not told that and not really, if my wife didn't put that in my head and I might've continued to do that um, as he grew older um, and let him, so that same feeling I felt about my older brother being light skinned and um, him having the success that he did, especially in the dating world, um, I could be passing that same thing down to my son and him seeing me with my wife um, and maybe not thinking that he could have the same thing because he wasn't the same complexion. And so that was a lesson that I even taught my, I had to be taught myself. A lot of times people automatically assume, I was born in the United States, I was born in Michigan, but when people meet me, you're African. What part of Africa are you from? Um, because I believe it's my dark skin, they just automatically assume I'm from Africa. No, I'm not. I, I believe I have some features because I've been told that. However, I've never been to Africa. I would like to go someday, but I believe just with that alone, uh, I'm from another country, another place. So I believe that's a big misconception because before you even meet me, before I can even speak, you automatically assume I'm from Africa or from an island somewhere, and I'm not. I joined the military in 1992, and I was a soldier in the United States Army for three years, and I was a truck driver, a transportation specialist, so that was a different experience. I felt like I did experience colorism even there with my dark skin. Uh, I, I do believe I experienced colorism. I believe I would have had better opportunities However, I always persevered. Being a dark-skinned man, um, I, I do find myself um, in uh, groups of people. I find myself maybe um, either purposely being outgoing um, and trying to be as funny as possible to make sure that no one sees me as a threat because that's what I have always um, kind of been seen as, especially because of my size, stature, and complexion. And so um, I think that it is extremely important and has become extremely important for me to uh, neutralize any stereotypes as fast as I can um, before I even get a chance to simply just be myself. And so, um, which that is part of myself. I, I mean, I think that um, over time, defense mechanisms become a part of your personality. Um, and so it's, it's something that I don't want to, I no longer feel fake doing it because I understand that that's just who I am. Um, but I, if I want the best out of people, then I have to help erase some of the, the, the stereotypes and the um, implicit bias that they may have uh, as fast as I can. Um, because sometimes that becomes a barrier um, into one in the professional world getting to the next level. Um, if I allow those um, feelings and those insecurities to, to, to be the, the front runner, um, but I may never, never see my way to the top. And so um, it's important to, um, you almost kind of always have to be the bigger person um, in almost every situation because you want, uh, you want to be seen as who you are and not who um, the world says that you may be. Knowing our worth and that colorism does not define us, that can be tough when you don't know your worth. But I would just speak positive affirmations you know, start telling yourself, read. You know, there, there are many, so many beautiful dark women in this world and the way that they carry themselves and begin to look at them, look up to them. And you will see that if they can do it, I can do too. Grab a journal and begin to write. Write 25 beautiful things about yourself because that is your truth. And begin to praise. We don't praise ourselves enough. Oftentimes we'll look at others and say, that person is better than me, prettier than me. They make more money than I do. But I want you to take a, I want people to take a, a closer look at themselves and just know that you are beautiful. And it's just not a statement, but it's not cliche, but you are beautiful. And just celebrate the qualities. What are the qualities that you possess? And when I began to take a look within myself, I was like, I'm not that bad. You know, maybe it's your hair. You, maybe you don't like your hair, the way that you fix your hair. Maybe you can go and have someone to help you um, to find a style that's more becoming, but celebrate yourself because if others don't celebrate you celebrate yourself, because that's a start. That's what I did. I, when I began to, my value was writing things down and speaking positive words over my life. All of us, there's no person that has it all together. Everyone feels 
some way, maybe your lips are too big, maybe your nose is too wide, but whatever that is, hey, make a statement with that nose, make a statement with that skin. I'm stepping out. I'm going to put some shimmer on this dark skin and I'm going to be beautiful because we have to celebrate ourselves. So that's what it's about. Learn to celebrate yourself. Even if no one is celebrating you, celebrate yourself. Confidence is it's progressive. Um, it is something that grows over time. Um, and so being comfortable with the process um, is, is what I would say, because it's, it's very easy, especially in today's world, um, it's very easy to look at the instant results that you may see because of Instagram and you might see social media period um, is almost chopping down everybody's confidence, to be honest, because we it is it is making the most superficial things, the most relevant things. And so I think that it's very important to, to understand that I look the way I look now, um, but I am still beautiful right now. Um, and my confidence will have the opportunity to grow um, as you get older um, and to also be comfortable with where you are now. And so if you aren't very confident now um, and are maybe insecure now, understand that that's just now that's just right now in this moment and that tomorrow you may wake up and see yourself even different and so um, and the world may see you differently and so um, just like I said before in the 90s I didn't feel like that was our time and now in the 2000s if you were dark skinned and bald you are you are the man like you are the person to go for and so um, but if I was not strong and resilient enough to make it uh, back then, I wouldn't make it to today. And so I think that that's important. Um, if you are that uh, young kid um, or that even that adult that is still unsure if you are beautiful, uh, it's important to really truly make sure that you understand it's a process um, and that you are the person that will continuously find fuel um, to, to see the beauty in yourself. It's easy to see the beauty within yourself when you know your worth, which in result is self-confidence. Beauty is much deeper than skin color. However, it's discouraging when others don't see you for you and don't see you as beautiful. Therefore, when people use microaggressions to invalidate both your inner and outer beauty, it causes us to second guess our worth as individuals and create insecurities within ourselves and others based on skin color. Darker skinned people, they receive more microaggressions mm -hmm. than someone who may be lighter skinned. Mm -hmm. So why is that? And what exactly is a microaggression for those who may not understand that? If you think of how media portrays darker skinned uh, people, if you go on to, for example, you watch Law & Order SVU, you see a lot of darker skinned folk portrayed as criminals, portrayed as poor, portrayed as welfare queens. And when it comes to the way how I describe it to students in terms of microaggressions, for example, you're telling someone you look nice for a dark skinned black woman. That's how I perceive microaggressions, and that's how I try to ex describe it to students in class. So I relate it to the media, and then I try to relate it to their daily lives to let them know that when it comes to racism, when it comes to colorism, it's omnipresent. Another misconception of colorism is often stereotyped as people with darker complexions expressing self-hate upon themselves and jealousy upon those who have lighter skin tones. In retrospect, those who have lighter pigmentations are often stereotyped just as much as someone who has darker complexions. They are often stereotyped as having a superior complex because they are passing, meaning they are portrayed closer to white. However, this experience has often caused division amongst both dark and light complexions. The division has altered one's expression based upon their personal experience because of what is perceived to be. It is perceived that all light-skinned people have had it much easier than someone who was much darker. While this perception and experience was, and in many ways, still is quite accurate, it just may not necessarily be the case for all. I grew up in a little small town called Adams, Tennessee, and my color 
growing up, we were so close that we didn't even look at the color of my skin. But then, of course, I experienced late on in school, uh, matter of fact, I was called Casper the Friendly Ghost at one point. But to me, it was just a joke. I didn't take it seriously because my parents never, ever, they was parents that stressed us love more so than the color of your skin. I never let it uh, control me. Or I never, really, I never ever looked at it as being, being light, lighter than anyone else. My uh, mother, mother was black, but her father was half white. My father, father was black, but his mother was Cherokee Indian. My older sister was light complected, and but I was the lightest of all of them, of my mother set, but my mother's sister, her children, some of them was my complexion. I grew up in Huntington, West Virginia, and the way colorism influenced my life was from an early age, from oh, roughly four to five, I understood um, what color I was in comparison to the majority. Because of where we lived, I had to attend a predominantly white uh, middle school, or at that point in time, it was a junior high school. And I can remember the other kids made fun of the way I talked, the way I dressed, I, um, I reacted different to uh, different things that were going on in the community at that time. So colorism, even early on, was, was quite a, a, a challenge not only to deal with, but even within my own community, because of my complexion, um, that created an additional challenge in that uh, some of the kids who were, were darker complected had certain um, expectations and had certain um, biases against me. And during that time, I, I remember as, as a young kid and um, even as an adolescent growing up, I was trying to figure out where I fit in because um, I was too light to fit in within my broader community, and I was uh, too dark to fit in in the majority community. So it, uh, it, it just represented a number of challenges. My really first experience was in 1967, after I finished high school, I uh, was in Kansas City, Missouri, and I was dating my husband. The police approached him, telling him that that wasn't allowed and it was in Missouri. And they was telling him that uh, interracial couples was not allowed and he had to let them know that I was black. They asked for my, they wanted some identification, proving that I was not white. And that, that was the very first, heart, you know, other than just little remarks, but that's the first, what you call the hurting experience I have, our first experience in 1967. It hurt me to the point that I, uh, I never, I always looked at people, cause I was around some white people growing up, cause a white family raised my father. So I was hurt to the fact that that's the first time I experienced, I guess you said prejudice that I uh, always thought, I looked at everybody as somebody. I never ever distinguished whether you were black or white, you know, and it hurt me to the point that I was stunned. Do you, I was really, I, I was, I couldn't even uh, react back or respond back because I didn't know how to respond at that point because that was a new experience. I would have to be Ray Charles to say that I didn't look in the mirror and see that I was, as they said, high yellow at that time. So it offended me to the fact that 
I was being judged by something I had no control of. No one asked to come into the world. No one asked to, uh, what complexion they want to be. So this is something that is given to you at birth, and you just learn to deal with it. What I've understood over the years and what I didn't fully understand at that point in time was because I am lighter complected, that other blacks were looking at me as being closer to white and how much hatred there was for the white community and, and the treatment that people had, of course, undergone. I guess the misconceptions were that, um, you know, it, on a playground, I couldn't run as fast, I couldn't jump as high, uh, I couldn't play games uh, to the same level as my uh, peers or contemporaries, uh, that um, I would be smarter academically, that I would uh, excel in a different arena. And um, so, again, I knew those things weren't true. So me personally, uh, especially as a black male, um, I, I let that fuel uh, me outdoing my peers and contemporaries any chance I got. And I developed a very competitive, almost combative spirit uh, to where um, I was very hypersensitive for, for a number of years about uh, being treated a certain way in my own community because something that was never fully explained to me and something I didn't understand was, how much black blood do you have to have before you're considered black? Or before, how, what complexion do I have to be to be part of the mainstream? You know, it is it, uh, I didn't consider myself better than anyone else, so why should someone else, even within my own community, consider me to be better than what they were? One of the things that I embraced, however, uh, early on from my community and from the black experience during that era was the importance of education and looking at at it as a means or as, as a vehicle for transcending your, your current situation and doing better. I learned to accept who I am without you trying to dictate to me who I am. Life, to me, I've always ex looked at life as uh, it's what you make it. So if I chose to let me being light complected, dictate to what I'm going to do in life or who I am, I'm already defeated. Because some going to accept you light complected and some going to reject you. And that's life, period. Uh, you can't please everyone. So the biggest person you ought to please is yourself. I used anything I could as a point of leverage to uh, move forward. Life is, is very fleeting and short, and people who tend to focus too much on one area, such as complexion, uh, there's always going to be somebody, even if you're light-skinned or dark-skinned, there's always going to be somebody who's going to be taller, who's going to be shorter, who's going to be more attractive physically, uh, who's going to be more gifted in a certain area, so be happy with the tools that, that you got and understand what those tools are and how they can be used to not only better yourself, but others who are like you. In order to hate an individual because of the color of their skin, you already have a problem dealing with yourself because if uh, you're going to let skin color bring the word hate into your heart then you need a lot of researching done on yourself. So therefore, I uh, would instruct anyone that they have a problem with someone color of their skin, that first of all, do an inventory of yourself and see where you stand at with yourself before you try to start judging someone else. I'm a loving, caring, happy person, love people, I am a 
outgoer. I don't meet strangers. I'm just, I just love life. There are some ups and some downs. And I've always been learning, taught in life. Uh, 10% is the problem. The 90% is how you deal with it. So I chose to hook on to the 90% and make the best of it. There are a few ways the light skin perspective can be perceived. One is understanding they face many hardships themselves. The most common perpetuation is the perception. You still have had it much easier than I have simply because you are light. So how do we as a people approach this situation? How do we heal from a wound that was created and illustrated to us through fragmentation and slavery that has now become internalized and a curse within the origin of black culture to further cause division amongst our own community? So how can we interact with one another to where both the dark skin and light skin perspective become acceptable to one another? I asked Dr. Gibson why this situation continues to be a barrier within the 21st century and why this experience continues to be a sensitive subject. And here's what she shares. Why do you feel like a lot of times darker skinned people perceive lighter skinned people as being better than or being perceived as or stereotyped as having, I guess, more superior um, complexes? Why is that? Well, I would say it goes back to the, the history of our nation. Um, of course, America was built on the, the backs of black and brown people. Um, and during that time, um, we, we were brought here under the guise of oppression, and we have continued to be oppressed um, during these uh, many generations um, moving forward. But one of the, there are different forms of oppression, and one of which is fragmentation. Um, and fragmentation is essentially that intentional division. Um, and so if we, if we think back to the um, to the enslavement era where the um, lighter skinned um, black people who were of course the, the children of the slave masters um, were treated better, better. Now they were still enslaved um, but they were treated better and so um, they in turn uh, many of them adopted the, um, the um, attitude of um, I am going to be treated better, and they were in fact being treated better. And then the darker skinned um, enslaved Africans um, then uh, saw that um, and then experienced that uh, those differences in treatment, I um, mean, that still continues today, even in terms of if we, if we look at the judicial system, um, research indicates that um, African American males who are lighter um, actually will receive a um, lighter uh, punishment for the same crime as uh, dark skinned um, African American males. Um, so uh, that difference in treatment it is still around today, unfortunately, um, and sometimes we even internalize that. So um, we may treat each other differently based on that as well. This repetitive experience of colorism from white versus black people and black versus black people has altered the way we as a nation see value in one another. The most hurtful factor within the whole equation is no matter how much our nation attempts to progress, Individuals, meaning white people and black people, still intentionally remind people of color they are black. In result, causes many people of color, both dark and light skinned, to recall a time. It was first inadvertently, and in some cases deliberately, illustrated to them that they were indeed black. I realized I was black probably around the age of six. I realized I was black, real black. And uh, some of my friends, they had the light skin and they began to compare themselves like, oh, you are dark. And sometimes they would tease and say names like Blackie and things like that. I didn't know what that was. And at six years old, I was like, what is wrong with me? And so it made me sad because for the first time, I just thought I was this happy kid. And then I figured, I realized that it was the colorism, comparing even my siblings, we compare who was more lighter. Well, I'm more light skinned. You're dark. I'm not dark. You're darker than me. So darker than me, it felt like I'm not good enough because I'm darker than you. I was darker than most. And so I, I remember times I would try to rub the color off my skin. I would literally try to like take a washcloth and I would just scrub and scrub and scrub because I heard, you know, you can wipe that black off or something. So I was like, maybe I can 
just rub it off and then I'll be a light skin, you know, a lighter complected female. But um, that's what had happened during that time. From the first time I acknowledged and when I knew who I was from the beginning of first grade, because it, I was always input in me that I'm black because my parents, we, I didn't know nothing but black. And keep in mind, I grew up in an era where there was only, uh, there was no integration. So everybody I came in contact with was of the black race. So I never ever felt anything but black. During my era of time, there was love. The, all the families that I grew up with was all considered one big family. If you was of the black race, you were just one big family. So there was ne I was never felt uncomfortable. I was never ever felt that I didn't belong. So therefore, I didn't experience this until after I became uh, an adult. Probably when my brother and I were on the back seat, we were in the car and we were driving downtown and it was the summer. Uh, during that period, no one had air conditioners in the car and you had your windows rolled down. And um, there's a white man walking along the street and flicked a cigarette butt that was still lit into the driver's side of the car where my, and landed on my dad's lap. My dad got furious, of course, put it out, jumped out of the car. Well, there was a policeman standing on the corner and uh, he got involved immediately, the policeman did, and told my dad, um, you know, to get back in the car I uh, used a couple of epithets and, and um, um, you know, shut your mouth and keep driving or else I'll haul you downtown. And uh, that happened in front of us as kids. I guess I was oh, about six. My brother was 10 at the time. And um, you just had instances like that to pop up once more, uh, once a day, or multiple times a week, so that you understood right up front who you were and what your place was, that people didn't regard you on equal grounds. I first realized that I was black. Um, I, would, <laughs> I would probably say uh, maybe two or three years old. Um, it was fairly early um, because of uh, where I grew up. Um, there were a lot of us, <laughs> um, but we also, in Inglewood, California, it was, it was fairly black and brown. Um, so I did notice that there was um, a difference at a very early age. And so um, around three years old, I would say, was probably when it totally hit me that, that I was a different race than um, our next door neighbors. Um, the complexion is 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 definitely the the core. Then I have a that's the core of the cake, and then I do have some some icing as well because I'm um, I'm a dark skinned black male, um, but I'm also uh, about six one. I'm a pretty big sized guy, so those things um, just help pile stereotypes on top of me. And when media is reinforcing that these dark skinned males are doing this and they are aggressive. Um, you start to kind of see a little bit of that in yourself. And so it's easier for you to navigate towards um, survival and gang life um, because you feel like that's the route that you're supposed to go because that's what you see on television. And so growing up, um, to be honest, uh, there, there were very, very little, uh, very little representation of African-American cultural period on TV. Um, of course, we had Family Matters. Um, and there were a few other shows, The Cosbys, um, but for the most part, um, I grew up on Full House. I grew up on Step by Step. I grew up on a lot of these shows that showed white culture, um, but not very many that showed um, African-American culture. So uh, what came on right after those shows was the news. And the news was almost always reinforcing violence in our area and in our neighborhood. And so. 
um, yeah, I think that that definitely played a role in why it took so long for me to maybe feel um, super confident being myself um, and truly learning who uh, myself actually is. So through these altered experiences between light, medium, and dark complexions, each person's story and experience share a common denominator that transcends beyond complexion, and that is being reminded no matter how light or dark you are, we are still black in America. Being black in America means no matter the hue of complexion, there are some, but not all, individuals who simply don't and are unwilling to see any person of color as equal and valuable and are willing to take strategic protocols to remind people of color just where their place is in society. So how do we not treat each other differently based on the experience of other people who don't understand us and how we are categorized? How do we see ourselves as one mm -hmm. despite people who may not understand black culture not seeing black culture as one. I think it goes to um, goes back to self-love and being able to love ourselves authentically. Um, everything that we are, everything that we've been through, that, that makes us as a people, as a culture. Um, and being able to love ourselves. Um, so, you know, if we're, you know, able to get away from um, the skin lightening products or the um, hair straightening products or trying to fit this stereotype of what America perceives as beauty, but being able to love ourselves just as we come out and when we can love ourselves and we can love um, each other. How can we desegregate ourselves, people of color, um, from the origin of racism? How do we desegregate the whole light skin versus dark skin thing? Mm -hmm. um, I know Dr. Gibson talked about, you know, self-love. What advice could you give with that? One of the first things I would say is just acknowledgement and give that history and also understand how can we help the next generation in order to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. But also the older generations, they need to understand, especially with the African American community, understand how they have influenced the issues of colorism and how they have continued to permeate it. So for example, I've had family members that have stated dark skinned women are not attractive. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask them like, okay, why do you think that? They would specifically say that, dark, that women are not attractive. Um, and it was specifically Viola Davis and Leslie Jones. I'm like, okay, well, why are you saying that? Are you saying it because you don't find her attractive from a subjective standpoint, or you don't find her attractive because of her skin color? And then that started a whole nother conversation. But now those family members, they're more aware and they start to change their minds, change their mindsets about what is considered attractive, Eurocentric features that we always try to adhere, um, some people try to adhere to, or that we try to put on a pedestal. With realizing no one group of people, meaning light skin or dark skin individuals, are superior or inferior to one another, we began to humble ourselves and understand that who we are is deeper than our skin complexion. We began to see ourselves through a different lens. We began to see our dysfunctions and learn how to break our generational patterns. We began to see one another beyond who's light and who's dark. We simply learned to see each other for who we are and love ourselves and others in the process. I'm 50 years old, I'll be 51. I think I look pretty good. Um, I love my skin, I love my dark skin. Now I wish I was darker. I wish my skin tone was even darker because when I see these beautiful supermodels, I'm like, oh my gosh, could I not have been a shade darker? Black skin is so beautiful, so I'm very confident. Um, my husband, I, he always was like, baby, you're so beautiful and so, you know, I celebrate all my dark sisters and brothers, anyone. It's a beautiful thing. And right now it's popular. It's popular to dark skin is in. You know what? It's always been in. It's always been in because anything that God creates is beautiful. So, you know, hey, I'm happy. Despite, you know, whatever happens in life, how people look at you, how they treat you by the outside, you're still special. I always knew that I was special. God created me to be a special young woman. As a young woman, I knew that. And so it's like what they see on the outside, 
I didn't see myself as this person that they seen, that they deemed me to be. And so the advantage was having great confidence, having having God in my life and those things. And it truly, it carried me to, had opened a lot of doors for me. And I believe the confidence comes from within. So I'm grateful for the foundation that I had because it's the foundation that kept me on the right path, despite the negativity that was associated with having dark skin. My family used to pick at me all the time. I had one cousin, if I call his name, Reverend Thomas Liggett, Jr. He laughed, oh, we got this one little white girl in our family. But it, he always said it in a loving way and joking. So the family never took it seriously. So, and then I, yeah, I've been in situations where I, that, especially on my job the years ago, they would, uh, we would have, I would be in the office, I was in management, and they would laugh, and a uh, company was made, said that uh, we don't have no white, no black representing in management. And uh, I spoke up, I said, yes, they do. I said, me. They said, well, that's the answer they gave, well, as to say, you don't, you're not one of us. But then too, it's because going back to how my parents taught me that I was able to deal with that and it made me stronger and prepared me for the things that I faced as I was growing up with the complexion, being light complexion. Naturally, for me, I embrace it because it represents an amalgam of a lot of different cultures, some of which I'm aware of, some of which I'm not. All of us make up this very special, resilient, uh, resourceful community. And we should take pride in that. And uh, while I could portray myself as being uh, something else, um, I self-identify with as being a, a very vibrant member of the black community. Uh, yes, I do love my complexion. Um, I think that I have have grown to love. I've I've loved what color looks like on my complexion. I've loved um, jewelry. I love I love the pop of anything off of my complexion. So I feel like I I love my dark brown skin. Um, but I love how gold looks great on my dark brown skin. I love how the color yellow looks great on my on my dark brown skin. And so um, I think that um, understanding the color wheel and what colors go best together, I feel like um, dark brown is one of those neutrals that you can throw almost any color on and look good. And so I'm happy that my skin is the complexion that goes with everything. And so, um, yeah, I think that I have I love my shade, I love my complexion, um, but I, I also, I know that it is, it's something that came with time. Um, it definitely was not, not a regular thing for me and it was something that I had to grow into, uh, but now I, I wouldn't choose any other way. Um, I love being a dark skinned man um, and I think that we are universally in, in style now for good. <laughs> As we begin to learn to love ourselves and others who differ from us, there are still parts of us that we want to withhold from others, causing us to be trapped in our traditional patterns of fear. And when we are trapped, we simply don't grow. I wanna ask both of you this, what ways are we still enslaved um, in reference to colorism <laughs> and how can we overcome it? Mm -hmm. We are slowly shifting away from it, but it's still very much an issue. But we have this um, European standard of beauty. Um, and I think a lot of it is influenced by the media, uh, what media says is beautiful and what we see in magazines, on, on TV, on social media. Um, and we say, I want to look like that. 
um, and our children look at these images, I want to look like that. Um, the dolls in the stores, you know, I want to look like this. This one is pretty, this one is not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that collectively, as a community, we all have a responsibility. Um, I would love for our um, celebrities to take more of a stand on this issue. And some of them have done so, um, but I would like to see it even be uh, more public um, and, um, and just more prominent as well. There is this idea of racial socialization about there's five stages that black and brown people go through to develop a racial consciousness. And the first one is naivety. You're born into this world and you don't really know what's going on, but you notice those nuanced things. For example, how a teacher may treat a white ch uh, child or a light-skinned child compared to a dark-skinned child. And so what you do, you change that mindset thinking, okay, I can't do that, but they can. So how do I tailor my mindset? How do I tailor my reality in order to survive? So we're taught this idea of survival from uh, according to the study from two, the age of two. And there have also been studies where children have stated they think that light-skinned children and also white children are much, are prettier than dark-skinned children just because of their dark skin and they judge them and they have certain associations to dark skin. But I honestly think it has to deal with teaching from a very young age. So going back to social media, there's this video of Ariana a young four-year-old girl who was getting her hair done, I think it was by her aunt, and she started crying, you know, saying that she was ugly. And not only were they talking about her skin color, because she was dark skinned, but also her features too. Um, having a wide nose, having full lips, what's not accepted, because what Dr. Gibson said about European features that we privilege uh, in the media. So. I think it does have to deal with going from a very young age. And it goes into like it goes into the family dynamics too, because you're sitting there and you can hear your family saying, Well, I don't like the way ha because she's dark skinned. She shouldn't wear those colors. She shouldn't wear those uh, outfits with those uh, specific colors because it just doesn't look right on her skin, but that's wrong. So how do you dismantle that also in the family too? It's uh, two entities that parallel, but there has to be that connection in order to get kids to be more open and try to challenge those dynamics too. Our differences to achieve a common outcome are unique because we as people are unique. So where do we start when it comes to accepting and embracing individuality? How do we become unified? The simple answer to this is to accept our differences and to truly love who we are as well as to truly love others. I would say that I am empowered because I love my shade. Um, empowered is something, it almost, um, it almost defines the process um, because if you are empowered, that means that you were maybe at one time not in power. If someone is born already with power, then they can never be empowered. And so uh, what, I, what that means for me is that once maybe I felt weak, uh, maybe I felt unseen, um, but because of the fact that I now truly love my shade, I am empowered um, to do anything that I want to do and uh, take over the world if I want. I am determined because I love my shade. I am determined to uh, prove any misconception from any direction uh, that is not based on reality, that's not based on factual evidence from me, I want to prove those things false. Very determined to help others coming behind me that look like me and even those who don't. Very determined to remain positive despite a lot of the negative challenges and obstacles that uh, I've encountered. I am beautiful because I love my complexion. I'm beautiful. I didn't know that at one time. People would say, you're such a pretty little girl. I didn't feel beautiful. I was like the ugliest. I would think I was Frankenstein. I said, I'm so ugly. 
because of what they said about me, but I'm beautiful because of my dark skin, because of my complexion. Yes, I am. I am loving, I'm kind, I'm beautiful because I am who I am. And my shade, if it played a part in it, then that's part of it. <laughs> when you are aware of your worth, it exudes a whole different level of confidence, which a result is just so damn sexy. No matter what people say about your complexion to damage your personhood, you know you can stand firm because you know other people's projected insecurities of who they think you are are not your reality. I asked each individual what it means to be sexy in their skin, and here's what they shared. What makes my complexion sexy? Because it's Frances, and Frances knows she's sexy. <laughs> what makes me sexy is my personality. See, I'm a businesswoman, I'm an entrepreneur, and I think all of that is sexiness, confidence. Confidence is sexiness. You gotta have some confidence, especially women. I'm speaking to women, have some confidence. A man loves a confident woman. Be confident in yourself that you can do it. And when you look good, they know it. Walk into that room and say, hey, I'm here. Let's get the party started. That's right. Carriage, meaning how I carry myself. To take pride and publicly portray that sense of self-integrity and dignity that you have. And walk in a room like you own it. Talk to people like they're there to meet you instead of you meeting them and take pride in who you are. So for me, that's sexy, the, the, the whole notion of carriage, how you carry yourself, that, that air of confidence or quote unquote, don't give a damn about what others think about you. What makes me uh, the most sexiest I can be as a dark skinned man um, is feeling myself um, that's extremely important. Um, you can wear whatever, um, but if you truly feel yourself, I guarantee there'll be somebody that'll go home and look to buy your same outfit. And so I think that's extremely important. Um, I wanted my exterior to shine just as much as my interior. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's what makes me sexy is that um, I don't think anybody can mess with my personality, my sense of humor. I truly mean well in everything that I do. Um, I don't have any malicious thoughts, and I think that those things are what really makes a person sexy, is not just the exterior, um, but, what, but truly being the best person that you can be. Each person and their shared experience illustrate our worth is beyond our complexion. In closing, I encourage each of you to ask yourself this question daily. How do we overcome a system designed to create division between Blacks and amongst all people? Is this something we are willing to address and seek to overcome? Better yet, can we overcome it? Are we willing to see one another as equally valuable within our hearts? Or is this a phrase where we only state and post on social media platforms to mask our ugliness and corroded hearts for one another? Lastly, what are you doing to bring people closer together than drawing them further apart? If your heart, not your mind, is unable to answer this, then maybe you are the problem. I challenge each of us to look within our hearts. What insecurities and unhealed experiences do we have that is causing us to create more division? While we've only addressed a fraction of the issue of colorism, there is still more work to be done. The best part of progressing and doing the work is realizing it takes us as people willing to be humble enough to see ourselves and willing to do the work to rise above our dysfunctions. I want to acknowledge each person for sharing their experience. I hope through each shared experience, we understand individuality and uniqueness is essentially valued, worthy, and enough. Most importantly, I hope each experience provided the understanding, no matter our complexion, 
and experiences, we are all created equal. And we were created to be and represent a palette of shades. <laughs>